I'm a big proponent of just vulnerability in general. And the thing that, that makes vulnerability so important and so powerful is that it creates a transparency and a trust between everybody involved. You know, when, when you're willing to expose your weaknesses or at least be honest about them, um, it, it helps people know that you're dependable. You know, it's like, oh, okay, this guy, like I can trust something that comes out of his mouth. Welcome, everyone, back to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got Mark Manson in the house. Good to see you, man. How you doing? It's good to be here. I'm pumped. Uh, I've been learning about your stuff for a while now. You've been writing on long, online for a long time. Amazing articles. You have a, an amazing website where you publish all your content, and now you have a new book out that is a massive hit already. Uh, big New York Times bestseller. I think it's been on the list for how long now? Basically since it came out. Basically since it came out. <laughs> so like nine months, eight nine months? Nine months every yeah. single week or is it dropped off yeah, at all? Every single week. Every single week, nine months, the subtle art of not giving a fuck. A counterintuitive approach to living a good life. Make sure you guys pick it up right now if you haven't got it. We're going to dive into this and a lot more today. I'm Oops. super pumped about this. You're good. Okay. Super pumped about this. We've got some mutual friends. Um, you, you're, you're not really out there publicly that much, though, like on social media. You post your stuff, but you're not like... Yeah. You're not- I, I'm, I'm bad at that. <laughs> yeah. I'm bad at self-promotion. I'm not like... I, I'm just... Yeah, my wife's always bugging. She's like, "Why don't you use your Instagram account?" Right? <laughs> you, yeah, you, you never like, do. You have like thirty thousand followers. I was like, yeah. "Oh yeah, I, sh- I should take pictures." That's yeah. funny. <laughs> You're like, "Well, when I'm on the New York Times list every week, it doesn't matter, right? You don't have to promote it." I guess when you write that great of a book, it speaks for itself. <laughs> yeah. um, very excited about this. Why did you decide to to start talking about this? You know, why did you write a book? A counterintuitive approach to sure. living a great life, and a lot of things you say in here, I want to get into because I'm like, huh. Yeah. Is it all true or whatever? Yeah, so yeah, I'm excited yeah. about this. Um, I wanted to write, I decided a couple of years ago, I really wanted to write a self-help book about pain because there's a lot of self-help books out there that about positivity and growth and, you know, striving. And uh-huh. I wanted to talk about the sucky things in life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like I want, and I, and I wanted to make an argument that I guess negative negative experience or negativity it matters. Like you can't you can't just pretend like it's not there. Mm-hmm. You can't just go through your life. You can't like, just say positive thinking no matter what. Yeah, yeah, like it's every no matter how successful you get, no matter how famous you get, no matter how much money you make, no matter how awesome your relationships are, things are gonna suck sometimes, no matter what. And you're you're never gonna avoid that. And so, kind of my starting point with this is like, all right, so let's talk about what it's like to have things suck um and how can we not necessarily get rid of that or solve it but like just live through it better suffer better basically. suffer better yeah do you believe we can end our suffering uh no <laughs> why not um well I, I talk about it in the book i i make the point that you know pain exists for a reason like we evolve pain for a reason because it it you know, if you think of like a little kid touching a hot stove, like that's actually a really important experience. It teaches the kid, don't touch a hot stove anymore. Yeah. Like that's going to, that that's dangerous. It's going to hurt you. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so pain uh, evolved to kind of show us like what's dangerous and what's not, you know, what, what can threaten us or, or what could harm us and what, what doesn't. So pain's not necessarily a bad thing. Like pain can actually be a very important and beneficial thing depending on the context and the circumstances. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a necessity in life, I would argue. So is, is I agree that pain is a necessity. Do you think this, that suffering is a necessity? Um, well, are you defining suffering as like the meaning we attach to pain or like how I would, would you define like it? say like ongoing pain. Okay. That like, okay, you've touched the stove, you felt the pain <laughs> yeah. for 30 seconds do you need to hold and be attached to that pain for the next day or a week or a month and be like, oh, I touched yeah. this thing. It hurt. I'm going to hold on to this pain. I don't think suffering is – it's not – so in a, in a very broad – like just if we're looking at somebody's whole lifetime, yeah, I think so. Because there, there's, there are, there's always going to be some things in your life mm. that, you know, say a parent dies – 
right. um, or divorce or something like that is going to cause suffering. And I think it's okay for that to cause suffering. Like, I think it's normal. I, th- I would argue it's healthy for that to cause mm-hmm. suffering because um, just the experience of loss, you have to, you have to be attached to that pain um, because it, it was such an important part of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, that said, I do think probably a very large percentage of suffering in life, probably a large percentage of the suffering that uh, a lot of us go through is not necessary right. it's self-invented mm-hmm. or it's we create it um to make ourselves feel more important or to make excuses for ourselves things like that yeah yeah, yeah. so i learned from a, a famous meditation instructor uh krishna g who said that suffering is the obsessive self-centric thinking yeah and once we remove the obsessive self-centric thinking our suffering yeah leaves us yeah so we can feel attached to this pain of a divorce or a loss in our, yeah. our life, and we're constantly thinking about ourselves, what we're we're missing, what we're lacking, what we you know yeah. we had once that we don't have anymore. Yeah. But once we remove that obsessive thinking about what we don't have anymore, the suffering starts to end. Yeah. So I think we it's a decision, it's a choice that we can right. make at any moment. We could hold on to that sure. obsessive thinking and longing for years, and yeah. be like, I used to have this thing, and now I don't have it anymore. Yeah. I'm suffering. Or we can be aware and, uh, you know, and say, I'm moving forward yeah. at any moment. Yeah. I think there's a healthy balance to being like, you know, not just moving on when someone dies in the next hour. Of course. Hour, yeah. Just I mean? like, ah, oh, it's over. Yeah. There's a grieving <laughs> and all the uh, yeah. process. Well, it, it's interesting because, you know, and I, I spend a lot of the book talking about this. It's not necessarily, you know, the pleasure or pain that's important. It's the meaning that we attach around it. It's like, it's the story that we invent to kind of encapsulate it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think they're very healthy and positive story, or I wouldn't say, like they're very healthy stories and meanings that we can create around our pain. Mm -hmm. And they're very unhealthy stories and meanings we can create around our pain. And there's healthy meanings and stories that we can create around our our pleasure or our positive experiences. And there's also unhealthy meaning uh, and stories that we can create Mm -hmm. around our positive experiences. Um, And so, you know, kind of the the whole crux of the book is like, you know, it's just all about that meaning. It's all about what, you know, what values are you choosing? Like what, what are you, what is like the lesson you're pulling from all these experiences, both your good and your bad. Yeah. Um, because that's what matters. You know, if, if you just look at feeling good versus feeling bad, your life, everybody's life is doing this all the time. Um, you know, what, what stays constant and what like kind of keeps you, your center of gravity, like going the right direction, is that sense of meaning or that those values that you build mm-hmm. for yourself. Yeah, I agree. What would you say is the time where you suffered the most? Consciously, I think my first girlfriend, that first heartbreak. That's the worst. Yeah. Um, and, and just the way it happened. <laughs> I mean, she was cheating on me, oh. and I found out from, like, just this, like, one of her friends just picked up the phone and was like, dude, oh, man. you need to know about this. Oh. Um, so yeah, that was devastating. That, But probably like, so that was the biggest conscious pain. Biggest unconscious one would probably be my parents' divorce, but mm. that's one of those things that you don't, you know, you don't realize till you're like 20, <laughs> 26 <laughs> and in therapy and you're yeah, like, yeah. wow, this really fucked me up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, I hear you. Yeah. It's crazy how... <laughs> Um, powerful our parents' relationship affects us without us even knowing it. Yeah, absolutely. Like the things we do, say, mimic without us even being aware. Yeah. Even if we don't think we're being like our parents, we usually are. Yeah. It's just embedded in our brains, I yeah. guess, right? In our yeah. memory, and our psyche, whatever it is. And we repeat. I see myself doing this all the time. I'm like, all the things that I was like, I'm not going to be that way my dad is, my mom is. Yep. <laughs> and I see like a pattern sometimes of me doing it. I have to stop myself yep. and be like, who do I want to be? Yeah. You know, I don't want to be, I want to be like my parents in some ways, but not everywhere. Yeah. Every way. And yeah. how can I reinvent the process of a, a better way, a right. better experience, a yeah. better interaction with people than what I saw and mimicked every, you know, as yeah. a child. So I definitely agree with that. Yeah. Um, you talk about, you went on a, you went on a journey. You've traveled over 60 countries. Yep. You speak three languages. You were yep. in Brazil for a couple of years. Yeah. Met your wife there. What are the other language? Spanish? Spanish, but it's really rusty. Really rusty. <laughs> so Portuguese, you're better. 
Yeah, I'm better at Portuguese now. And your wife, do you guys speak Portuguese a lot, or does she speak English um, fluently as well? Oh, she's fluent in English. Yeah. Um, we, I'd say it's like 80-20, English, Portuguese. Yeah. Um, anything like serious is in English. <laughs> we flirt in Portuguese. Oh, really? You're like, we flirt and we obrigado. Talk. Yeah, we flirt. <laughs> we- <laughs> Very good. <Right? laughs> we, we flirt and talk shit in Portuguese. Really? That's <laughs> yeah, funny. Because it's nice because like, you'll be in a situation and it's like, you know, somebody like does something and, and you want to say something but you don't want them to hear <laughs> and so we just say it to each other we're like and wow can you believe that guy just did that until they <laughs> start speaking to you in portuguese yeah, right. like i can hear you that's happened a couple times. really yeah that's embarrassing yeah there was actually the, the funniest one was we were in brazil once mm. and uh we did like the, the worst uber driver ever and uh my wife like she was in a really bad mood and she just like starts talking shit about the uber driver in english like like five minutes no way and then we get to the destination the uber driver turns around perfect english no accent it's like have a good night guys. oh and my gosh like, oh God. <laughs> one one star rating <laughs> yeah I'm like, oh, this guy hates us oh so my much. goodness <laughs> wow yeah now why did you decide to travel to you know all these different countries and explore the uh, world um i read uh so i read tim ferris's book mm-hmm. back in 08 i guess yep, me too um you know, completely blew my mind, opened everything. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I always had kind of a dream of like doing like an around the world trip or something. Um, and it was when I, when I read that book, you know, around the same time I uh, had a crappy day job and I wasn't happy with it and I was young and I knew I wanted to do something on my own. Um, and I read four hour work week and it was like, two birds with one stone it's like whoa i can like travel and build a business and build a business at the same time and so yeah i did that um initially i was just going to do it for a couple years but i kind of got hooked really and just kept going and going and going yeah and how were you able to make money as you were traveling and fund this experience for you um initially i started with i did kind of like direct marketing stuff Uh so a lot of like affiliate sales and yeah um I was one of those obnoxious guy. I was like spammy stuff. And, sure, sure. And um, I actually started blogging. It was because back then, back in those days, it was like uh, everything was about, like blogging was like the big new thing. Huge. Yeah. yeah 2008, like, 2009. It yeah. Big. It's like if, you, if you're starting an internet business, you got to have a blog because yeah. that's like that's how you get traffic to come in and everything. Uh-huh. So I started I started a blog um, just to like drive traffic to, to some of my sites and, and it it started to take off really and um yeah it turned like i discovered it took about two years i discovered i was a pretty crappy marketer like i don't sell stuff very well (laughs) (laughs) and and i was always broke and like struggling and and trying to find like the next thing that would pay the bills and then um and then when i started writing like things got a lot more steady and and consistent so um yeah i just stuck with the writing it's crazy man now you get what two million uh visitors a month or is it Um, more now from the book i'm assuming well, it varies mm-hmm. quite a bit. Um, it's it's interesting because the blogs, I feel like the traffic is just going down in blogs because everyone's on social. Yeah. It's like more and more people aren't clicking on yeah. the link to go read a whole article. They'd rather read like a mini article on yeah. Facebook yeah. or Instagram. I, I feel blogging is in kind of like a recession right now. Really? Uh, yeah. It's, it's across the board. Everybody's traffic's kind of shrinking a little bit. Mine's dropped maybe 20, 25% in the last year. Wow. Um, but like, I know people it's, it's dropped like 50%. You yeah. Know? And people are struggling. I feel like, yeah, if you're not constantly reinventing yourself, like I think it was brilliant that you did this book at this time yeah. because it, it brought you even more mainstream credibility yeah. and continues to attract new people to your sphere of yeah. your, of your audience and people checking out your site now or your social, yeah. which you're never on Instagram. So you need to be <laughs> more of, but I think it's, it's powerful because I think most people aren't willing to reinvent and yeah. you were, doing the internet marketing spammy thing for a little bit. And yeah. if you kept doing that, you would have probably dropped off too. Yeah. But you found a way to reinvent with blogging. Yeah. And you stuck with that until you realize, oh, let me do the next stage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's always important. Uh, I was kind of in a similar spot. I was starting out in blogging. I was teaching LinkedIn and I yeah. was like, yeah, it's kind of dying. And then I did blogging then yeah. I did courses. And I was like, I felt like podcasting was going to come around. I was like, Hopefully, you know, <laughs> you're in the right space now, man. It was, it was like a two years before it kind of started getting big when yeah. cereal came out and everyone else started to do them. Mm-hmm. So I was like, thank goodness I started early. Yeah. But, um, 
But it's almost like now there's, you know, over half a million podcasts at least. Yeah. So it's like, what's the next reinvention? Yeah. I'm always looking for the next reinvention. So yeah, yeah you got to, you got, you got to keep looking ahead. And, and yeah, I think looking back at my career, one of the things that I think I did well, um, and I think most people need to do, you know, throughout their career is be very honest at like what you're good at, what you're bad at, mm-hmm. and, and then double down on what you're good at. Yeah. Um, so you didn't start doing video after you launched your blog. You were like, I'm great at writing. Yeah. It's working. Let me double down. Well, yeah. And, and I, I tried, I've tried video. I've tried, I even messed around, tried podcasting a couple, few years ago. And, um, you know, I, I just, I'm very honest with myself of like, you know, is this something either, do I have a knack for it? Mm-hmm. Um, or is this something, is the learning curve something I'm willing to invest? Like, does it make sense? Mm-hmm. You know, so for like, for instance, with podcasting, I messed around with it, did a couple like interviews privately and and mm-hmm. played with like concept ideas. And as with most things, you know, it's, I you go into it thinking it's, oh, this could be simple. And yeah. then you actually try it and you're like, wow, this is really A lot hard. of work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I sat there and I'm like, well, this is going to be, you know, probably six to 12 month learning curve. Yeah, at least. Yeah. yeah. And, um, it's gonna take time to build momentum. Yeah. yeah. And, and is that something that makes sense to invest in right now? Or I could just like promote my book. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> so, right. so uh, you know, the book won out. Um, yeah. so uh, yeah, it's hard, but it's hard to be like honest with yourself a lot of times. Um, and just be like, yeah, I, I'm bad at this. Right, right. I should. I should do. Stuff. I should do the thing I'm good at. <laughs> right. You talk about being honest with yourself publicly and why it's powerful. Yeah. Why do you believe we should be honest with ourselves publicly, and what does that mean? Um, I'm a big proponent of just vulnerability in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so Amen. yeah, Amen. <laughs> and so I, that that applies across the spectrum. So our private relationships, our public relationships, um, professional relationships, mm-hmm. everything, and. Um, the thing that, that makes vulnerability so important and so powerful is that it, um, it creates a transparency and a trust between everybody involved. Um, you know, when, when you're willing to expose your weaknesses or at least be honest about them, um, it, it helps people know that you're dependable. You know, it's like, okay, this guy, like I can trust something that comes out of his mouth. Mm. Um, if you're if you're trying to make everything like rosy and sound amazing all all the time, um, and maybe fibbing a little bit or covering things up or like avoiding certain topics, right. you know people sense that, and um, and not only does it kind of prevent that that trust from building, but it also, um, you know it 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 makes you seem like aloof. I don't know. It it kind of just interferes with the the depth yeah. of the connection. The connection can never like get beyond a certain it's like something's depth. missing if someone's too perfect you know yeah exactly There's something beneath that because no one can live that way yeah yeah um at the example I, I i use an example in my book i'm like you know nobody likes a yes man and yet like if somebody's following you around just agreeing with everything you say you know within a couple of weeks you're gonna be like what does he what does he want <laughs> you know like what's his angle he's trying to get something out of me sure um it, and you know so i i have a, a chapter it's called the importance of saying no mm. and um you know and that's kind of my big point is like you need to hear no and say no because then people know you're dependable they know you're you're actually like you know you have your own identity and and mm-hmm. you're not just like manipulating the situation yeah i think it's powerful to say no i say yes a lot to a lot of people yeah and then sometimes people just expect me to constantly say yes. And I'm like, no, I can't do something. And then yeah. they get mad at me. Yeah. Because they, yeah. they have this expectation I'm supposed to do something for them yeah. all the time. And I'm like, I'm constantly giving to so many people. Yeah. I'm constantly like promoting other people. I'm constantly, you know, doing so much that sometimes I got to focus on my own stuff too. Of you course. Know what I mean? <laughs> of course. Well, <laughs> and, and if you don't, then that will strangle your ability to give Absolutely. in the future. So, you yeah. know, like if you don't cut out that time for yourself and then nurture yourself, then then you're not going to be able to right to be generous to others. And I think if you say yes to someone when you don't want to, you're going to resent that person too. Totally. So say no so you don't resent people. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, you also talk about, this is something I wanted to dive into, because you say you shouldn't have big dreams, right? Yep. Why? Sh- well, did I say shouldn't have big dreams? I think you talked about big dreams and uh, how it's, you can't be in the present when you have these big dreams. Mm-hmm. Um trying to think of 
exactly. Maybe uh, maybe I don't have the same. <laughs> maybe I'm not thinking clearly on it. But what are your feelings on having big dreams? I Should think, we have them or no? I th- I think they're fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I think dreams. So dreams, I would put in the category of they're fine, but they're overrated. <laughs> dreams are overrated. Yeah. Um, Why is that? Because I think a lot of times we, a lot of times we use our 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 dreams and our fantasies as a way of kind of escaping what we're dealing with right now. Mm. Um, and I think the other thing about dreams is it's actually very hard for us to know exactly what we want. Um, like I can't tell you how many people I've met over the years that they're like, uh, they're like. I want to run a business or I've got this amazing idea for a startup or I want to make a ton of money. And, you know, they have this big dream for themselves and they start working towards it. And it's like they make themselves like it's actually making them miserable because the actual process of doing it um, is not what they enjoy. They enjoy the and, and what what is actually happening is like, you know, they don't actually enjoy the the hustle or, or taking the risk or, or doing the work. They enjoy what they think the benefit will do to their themselves, you know. So they're unhappy with a part of themselves. They're like, oh, if I could just like have an amazing startup and be worth like twenty million dollars, everything would be great. <laughs> yeah. But it turns out that like they hate working on it, yeah. And and so it just makes things worse. And so um, I think dreams are fine. Like it's it's fun to fantasize, but I think it's it's also important to just be honest about what dreams are. Mm-hmm. Is that they're fantasies. They're fun, um, but a lot of them are motivated, uh, or they can easily be motivated by the wrong reasons. Um, and so I prefer to kind of take more of a present approach of like, okay, let's pay attention to like, how does this feel right now? How does the work make you feel now? Mm-hmm. Um, how how does accomplishing this task like how how does that reflect on you? Like how how do you feel about yourself after that? Um, because I think if you pay attention to that. That's actually what makes great things happen in your life is when you're like focusing on the day to day, you know, boom, this makes me feel good. That's what you get good at, mm-hmm. you know? Like I never sat down, you asked me before we started recording, you're like, did you ever think you were going to be a writer? And I no, I never thought I was going to be a writer. The way I became a writer was I was doing all this stuff for my websites and I didn't enjoy about 70% of it. Right. <laughs> And most of the part that I enjoyed or that came came easily to me, that, you know, that, that part of my work that I would sit down, you know, thinking, oh, I'll, I'll spend an hour on a blog post and I look up and it's been like six hours. Mm, you lost yourself in it. Yeah, like that was the writing. Mm. And so I didn't even know I, like, it was never a plan. It was never like, oh, I'm going to be a New York Times bestseller in five years. I'm going to do this and this. And it's like, no, it's just like writing makes me feel really good. I feel proud of myself. Um I enjoy the process, um, and I can't wait to do it again. And so, you know, that's what you just keep hammering on. And at the greatness is the side effect. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like if you if you find that, then the success and and all the accolades and stuff like that will come naturally. Like it it will be the, you know, it'll be the collateral. Right. Exactly. I I, I hear you, and I'm excited to talk about this because. There are so many people that tell me that they have these big dreams or what they yeah. want, but they're unwilling to do the work. Right. It's too hard to make it happen. They want the end result, but they don't yep. want the 10 years of the process yes. it takes to get there. And I have an exercise called the perfect day exercise where I have people say, okay, do you really want this? Walk yeah. through what a perfect day would look like for you where you'd find the most joy, the most happiness, yeah. the most fulfillment in, a, in the, you know your entire day. Hour by hour, walk me through what does your perfect day look like? Yeah. What brings you that joy? So I try to get people in the mindset of, okay, dream like crazy big dreams. Yeah. But make sure the journey and the process of spending 10 years to make it happen yeah. is something you love because it may take forever. Yeah. The bigger the dream, the longer it's going to take usually. Yeah. And if you are if you go through your perfect day exercise and you're actually not excited to work 12 hours a day yeah. on something, then it's probably not the dream for you. Yeah. And it, and it comes back to that honesty with yourself. Yes. Like the, the example I use in my book is – you know, for most of my younger life, I wanted to be a musician. And um, I had all these huge dreams and fantasies, you know, about being on stage and rocking out and like, you know, being like having this amazing album. And, 
And um, I mean, I had this dream for like six or eight years, like even after I started my business, I, you know, when I started my business, the first couple of years, I was like, oh, I'm going to do this to like make some money. And then I'm going to go back and do the music thing. Wow. You know, um, it, in my head, it was it was all just kind of like a means to the to the end of, that was the music. And I got to my my late 20s or the second half of my 20s and I just I had to be like really honest with myself like cuz <laughs> cuz I like I had friends who were back in music school and they were actually doing things like right. they were their bands were getting signed and they were like doing stu- like doing studio gigs and they were playing shows and and I was like wait a second they're actually like out doing it yeah, <laughs> you know taking like action i've been You're i've talking been about it yeah. i've been sitting in my room for the last six years yeah. like saying you know what i'm gonna do one day yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna be a big musician on stage so like i had to be very honest with myself of like you know like i don't think i actually like this like mm. you know because if i did i'd be doing it right you know i think i just like the vision of myself i i like i i like this fantasy that you being know, on I, stage but you don't like practicing for three hours a day right play guitar or piano or something yeah, or spending all my my money on equipment and right. like hauling it to rehearsals and you Getting know like, seven people to show up for a gig once a month yeah for like years you exactly know? <laughs> like it just it didn't happen no one care about you yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, so it was hard to let that go. But I mean, I think in hindsight, that was, I think I built that dream. That dream was like something that I kind of constructed when I was younger uh, to get me through some hard times. Uh Um, And once I got older and I was actually committed to to my business and my writing and, and other things in my life, I had to let it go. I had to be like, you know, this isn't this isn't serving me anymore. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it's like, I'm kidding myself. <laughs> your, and your mind space is somewhere else in yeah. fantasy land that you're yeah. not actually implementing and taking action on mm-hmm. as opposed to putting all of your energy and mind space into the current passion or dream that you did have, right? Absolutely. And we only have so much mind space in a day, I think. Yeah. In our lifetime. And totally. If we're, if we're thinking about something else we're not working or acting towards, then we're missing out on what we have right in front of us. Yeah. Um, you talk about self improvement and success and how they often occur together, mm-hmm. uh, but it doesn't. That doesn't mean they are the same thing. Yeah. So why uh, why do we assume they are? I think. I think because they often occur together. Um, I think a lot of us experience in our own lives when we have a breakthrough with ourselves. You know, with certain belief or certain mm-hmm. pattern in ourselves or we get, get over a fear, we see kind of the external success in our lives jump up a little bit. And so we just kind of start assuming that the two are the same thing, um, which is just, we do that about a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, but it's not necessarily. I, I think in a lot of ways, you know, for certain people, it might be, a breakthrough in their self and their, their self growth might precipitate like less success. You know, maybe they realize that, you know, the 80 hours a week they're working as a lawyer, like mm-hmm. is, is the thing that's making them miserable. And so the breakthrough means like giving up that career or giving up all right. that money or giving up the status that comes along with it. Um, you know, you, you get people who, who become very attached to material things, mm-hmm. um, you know, or maybe they, they don't have their, their priorities or their attention in their life like align the way that that it would be more healthy and, and part of that growth requires them to step down a little bit and step back and um, I think this is one area that you know it, it gets in the self-help world it, it gets a little a little dangerous because mm-hmm. it, it's it's fun to think about you know hey you can have this huge breakthrough and make a million dollars and it's but a lot of times that big breakthrough requires you letting go, wanting, <laughs> make, wanting to make a million dollars. Right. So you get kind of this weird catch-22 thing going on yeah, a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. What would you say is the thing that you're struggling with the most right now? Uh, you know, uh, honestly, this, uh, you know, I'm so proud of how well it's done. Um, dude, the pressure. Like... <laughs> Uh, the pressure of what what's next or what's you know it's you know we all like to over the course of our career i I think and i think everybody's like this anything you do you know the next thing you always want to be improving of course you always want the next thing to be better yes Um, but you're like nine months on the new york times list right so it's it's, like how do you top that yeah and it's (laughs) it's 
it sold i think it's i think it's the best selling audiobook of all time oh my gosh um uh, yeah, it sold a million copies in I think eight and a half months. A hardcover? Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> Congrats, man. That's huge. And so yeah, I mean it's like That's massive. It it is massive. But it, it's funny because now I'm I'm it's been almost a year and now I'm starting to look at okay, what's the next project gonna be? Uh um, how can I top this massive hit. Well, in and, and my natural inclination, because this has served me for the first ten years <laughs> of my career, is like, all right, what's the next step? Yeah. And I'm looking at it and I'm like you know, let's be honest, you know, the, the, the level of commercial success this book has experienced is something that it's like, it happens maybe two or three times a year in the entire publishing. Like, you know, there's maybe two, three books each year that, that do that, that do this. Maybe. And as an author, the chance of you hitting that twice, it's really hard. Yeah. It's like, it's, you know, and so much of the book's success is probably also out of my control. Um, I mean, it's a great title. It's a great cover. It's a great but, but timing it, of li- of the, yeah, the but, uh, world. It's like yeah, but all yeah, a lot of it is the timing. Um, a lot of it is just kind of like where we are as a culture right now. Um, and so yeah, it's it's. I've had to be honest with myself that like you know, it Mark, it's very unlikely this is going to happen twice. And that's and then on top of that, I've got you know, publishers, my agent. Uh, a bunch of other people who want to do stuff with me and they're like, all right, you know, you did this. Let's do something bigger. Yeah, let's let's match it. Or like, yeah. hey, this guy just sold this many books for Harper. Like, let's bring him in to do this with us and, you know, maybe really our hard. thing will blow up. And it's really hard. It's like the, the pressure is real, man. And so I've been kind of the last few months. But I've, you got to you got to listen to your own book, you know? Yeah. Just don't give a fuck. I know. It's hard. It's, <laughs> it's hard. so hard, man. Because then you're like, well, I'm not doing as good. Yeah. Maybe I'm not as yeah, worthy and, or I'm not smart anymore if it's not doing as well, right? Exactly. So there's all these kind of like assumptions or, you know, uh, I guess operating principles I've had for years now in my career. And I'm having to like tear them out of myself, you know, kind yeah. of be like, hey, dude, let go of that. Like that's not serving you anymore. Um, and it, it's been hard. It's it's I for a couple months now, I've kind of been playing mind games with myself, yeah. you know, just trying to get myself in the right headspace of like, you know, hey, it's all right if, you know, the next book doesn't have to be like this one or my next project doesn't have to like yeah. match this and um, and being okay with that. I you mean, know, like, yeah, I mean, a million copies in nine months. I think that's more than what Tim did in, for four hour work week. Yeah, I, have no I don't idea. think I think it took him years to get that. Yeah, it's it's massive. It's insane. What and what about the audio books? Is there more? How many? How many downloads there? Or is that all encompassing all books? Um, I don't know the exact number with the audio book, right, right. but um, but yeah, the Audible people told us uh, back in the spring. They said it's the most downloaded book on the like crazy dude in the entire <laughs> it's Audible unbelievable. site. Yeah, which is like some nice royalty checks off of those right there. <laughs> <laughs> I know what that's like, yeah. dude. This is amazing. I remember when I interviewed Liz Gilbert. She yeah. had mentioned. Similar, because Eat, Pray, Love was like this massive. Yeah. I think it was like ten million sales or yeah. something, and it was yeah. just it turned into a movie with, um, what's her name? Who's the Julia actress? Roberts? Julia Roberts, yeah. and she was like, I had Julia Roberts playing me, and it was just everywhere for years. And she was like, there was no way I was gonna be able to create something that that good. Yeah, like I had to kind of come to my senses that this might be the the most popular piece of work I ever do. Yeah, type of feeling, you know, maybe something. Which is hard, right? You always want to think your best things ahead of you, and 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 then suddenly when you start thinking that it might not be, that all that starts messing with your motivation. It starts me- messing with your identity. It starts mess like it, it's it's a mind fuck. And um, it's funny you mentioned her because she did a TED talk about that. I've watched that TED talk like three times <laughs> this summer. Like really, yeah, because it's um because like I'm a fan of hers like she's, she's great amazing, and man. and I was talking to a friend and, and she's like yeah Liz Gilbert did a TED talk about like her life after Eat Pray Love and how she couldn't like she couldn't write for like a year afterwards because no. it was just this insane thing that she thought she had to live up to and so yeah I, I watched that talk a couple times and yeah it's real like it's it's hard it's it's it messes with your head it really does um and then all the people who are not or are struggling right now. Yeah, they're all like, like, oh, yeah, you sold a million copies of your book. Get over it. So hard, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's the other funny thing, too. Um, and I, I talk about this a little bit in my book. You know, I, I, I point out, I'm like, you know, problems never go away. 
you know, like Warren Buffett still has money problems. Um, you know, he still probably stresses out at night and, and worries about things, but nobody's crying a tear for Warren Buffett. And, uh, you know, it, that's, that's kind of the weird thing with success sometimes is, is success as amazing as it is and, and, and as much as it can transform your life, it brings its own stresses with it. You know, it's it's like the Biggie song, "Mo Money, Mo Problems." Like it's, it's it true. brings its own it's so set of problems with it. But the thing is, is when you success problems, like not many people are going to sympathize with that. <laughs> you know, like no, not many people are sitting around going, "Man, poor War, Warren Buffett, like lost two billion on that deal." Like, man, that must be really hard for like nobody's saying that. Right. <laughs> you know, like it's there's no sympathy for that. Yeah, <laughs> the internal challenges that we face as human beings. The, no matter what happens, the more successful we come, we still have internal battles, challenges, yeah. stresses with all the money in the world, or, yep. you know, all the friends in the world, all the power, there's still going to be stress. Yep. If we don't know how to deal with our inner battles, yep. then we're going to be overwhelmed yeah. and we're going to suffer. Yeah. So it's a constant awareness of letting things go, of working on ourselves, I yep. think, in a positive way where we can enjoy the process and where we're at no matter what's happening yeah. in life. It's it, it and it's a never ending thing. Yeah. It's um you know another thing I say is is uh you know growth is not getting rid of problems, it's simply getting better problems. You know, you, yeah. you you never get to this point where you don't have problems in your life. You just trade in your problems for slightly better problems. Right. Like that's basically what growth is. You, men you mentioned uh, in the book about, you know, if you're, the problem is you're overweight or you're not healthy and then you go get a gym membership and you have to wake up early and you're like sweaty all the time and <laughs> you're like, you have a new problem, yep. right? It's like, but it's a better out. one, but it's a better one. You're yep. getting healthy, but you have this other challenge. Well, I have to get up earlier and I have to bring my clothes so I can shower at the gym and get to work on time or yep. whatever it is. So it's like a different set of problems and yep. challenges to get a better result though yeah right of course what uh, how do we eliminate problems in our life then or can we not i, I don't think you can i i don't think there's a such a thing as a problem free free life and i think i don't think we would want to eliminate pro because i i i make the argument that it's that process of solving our problems or overcoming our problems that's what that's like the engine that generates happiness mm. um and so when you actually remove problems it, it creates its own special kind of misery. You know, like if you imagine like the rich housewife who just sits at the pool all day, like it, or, or, or the peop the person who watches TV 10 hours a day, like it's, there's a lack of problems also creates, uh, you know, it prevents that engine of happiness mm -hmm. because like you need pro like the, the problems you, you need the problems because that's what generates the meaning. And if you don't have the meaning, then, you know, everything just feels pointless. And you're like, well, why do anything? Like, mm -hmm. I'll just go sit at the pool. Right. Um, so you need that that meaning. You know, it, it comes back to that what I was saying about the stories that we wrap around our positive and negative experiences. You know, like that meaning is what creates those those powerful stories that that pushes us, us forward and, right. um, you know, makes, our, makes us feel like our life is well lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you have a trust fund and you don't, you know, make meaning with your life. You just live off the money of someone else. Yeah. It doesn't feel like you've done anything. Yeah. You haven't accomplished anything. You haven't mattered in the world. You haven't contributed in any positive way. Right. Yeah. Contribution is probably one of the most important things for us. Whether Absolutely. we're contributing to our family or our community or in a bigger way, having that contribution is powerful. Absolutely. Yeah. And so there, there are a lot of miserable housewives, right? <laughs> yeah. Who are, yeah. who aren't. And know, trust fund kids. <laughs> right. Trust fund kids who aren't choosing to use their, their intelligence, their talents to make an impact. Yeah. And I think it's important to have that awareness that we should be trying to make an impact the best way we can. Yeah, for sure. Um, talk about the feedback loop from, loop from hell. How do we get it out of it? Or how oh, do we man. get into it and how do we get out of it? <laughs> so the feedback loop from hell is, it is a thing I talk about in the beginning of my book where we judge our emotions. Um, so, you know, a lot of us, uh, and I know I was raised this way, and I think a lot of people are raised this way. You know, I was raised that, like, certain emotions are inappropriate or they're just bad. Like, like what? Like anger. You know, you, you don't get angry or you don't show it um, or you don't, you know, don't be sad. Like, how many times has, has like, a well-intentioned friend or family member be like, don't be sad. Yeah. No, 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 <laughs> just don't be sad. Um, and so I think what 
the effect this kind of has on us is that we judge these negative emotions. So we decide that being sad is a bad thing or being angry is a bad thing or, you know, being feeling guilty is a bad thing. And then a funny thing happens because then we start feeling sad about the fact that we feel sad or we start feeling guilty that we feel guilty all the time. Or embarrassed or, that, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, or we feel angry that we're angry or we're anxious that we feel anxious all the time. And like, <laughs> and then it just kind of like keeps spiraling. We're like, God, what's wrong with me? I'm like, I'm always anxious. And it just keeps going and going and going. And so I call this the feedback loop from hell. And the way you short circuit it um, – is you stop giving a fuck is, <laughs> is you stop, you stop judging the emotion, you know, sad, like the way, the only way you can get out of it is sadness needs to be okay. Anger needs to be okay. Uh, anxiety needs to be okay. You know, the question isn't, uh, it's not necessarily the emotion that is good or bad. It's what you do about it. Um, it's how you react to it. It's the meaning, you know, you wallpaper around it. Um, because all these emotions, again, coming back to like the whole pain thing, like all these emotions, they exist for a reason. Like they keep us healthy. Like they're, they are natural responses. If somebody dies, be sad. Like you're supposed to be sad. Like that is part of your, your, your brain and your psychology's way of like processing it, yeah. digesting it. And, um, you know, the more you judge or try to like shut those emotions out, like the, just the worse it becomes. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> what about self-talk yeah what do you think about self-talk do you think it's important to have like a positive mindset mm -hmm. and to think positive things throughout the day or do you think it's irrelevant to feeling happiness joy and making an impact i think self-talk can definitely have an effect for people both positive and negative like i imagine if you're always telling yourself good things you probably feel better. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you're always telling yourself bad things, you'll probably feel crappy. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think that is true. Um, I don't necessarily, you know, again, my big focus is, is on meaning. It's, you know, I, I kind of, in the beginning of the book, I'm like, you know what, who cares whether we feel good or bad? Let's talk about like the meaning or the value that like underlies everything. Um, and I think self-talk is one of those things you can you can you can get yourself in the trouble through positive self-talk just as much as you can through negative. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what it comes down to is like how realistic are you being, and like what is what is the quality of the meaning that you're putting on this? Um, because I could have I could walk around being like I am the most badass motherfucker in all of L.A. You know, like that girl wants me, that guy wants to be me, like you know. <laughs> I can have positive self-talk all day, but that's yeah, yeah. probably not going to have a very healthy effect, <laughs> you know, if yeah. that's what I'm saying. You know, so it, it's the character of the self-talk mm -hmm. is what I think matters, and I think that gets lost a lot. Um, or it's it's something, it's more difficult to talk about that. Yeah. Um, because I think so many people, they, they just want to, they want that quick hit of like, mm -hmm. make me feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, like tell me, tell me something to tell myself to make me feel good. And it's like, you can do that, but like, you really got to pay attention to, you know, what, what is, what's the meaning and, and what's the identity you're building for yeah. yourself when yeah. you do that. What about belief? How does someone build belief in themselves then in order to create and take action on, you know, something like this? Mm -hmm. Cause I'm assuming you can't write a book this powerful and inspirational and meaningful if you don't believe in yourself, so um, how do you how do you create belief in yourself? See, I've got a I've got a pretty backwards approach to this. It's probably going to be be the opposite of of you or or most people you have on here, um, <laughs> which is I I don't really I kind of just I don't it's none of my business whether I'm a good author or not. Mm -hmm. um, I try not to think about it um, because again, what I notice is. If, if I get led in the negative self-talk, that will hinder me because I start thinking like, well, I'm like, I'm bad at this and I'm yeah. an idiot and I can't do this. And, but if I, if I start wandering off in the to positive self-talk, like, oh, I'm the man, like everything I write is gold, you know, that also adds pressure mm -hmm. and starts. And like, that's kind of what I was talking about. Like the problem with like, I don't like thinking I'm great at something <laughs> i know i know we're on the school of greatness sure, but like sure. but like that that also it puts pressure on because now that's something you have to live up to and 
I just try to let go of all of that. I just try to say, I don't know if I'm good or not. Um, I don't really care. I have these things that I that I believe are very important for mm-hmm. myself and for others, and I just try to focus on that. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I kind of had an argument recently with my publisher about my next book. Um, you know, like they were, they had like they had are pushing. They're like, "This is what we want." This yeah, it's it's like they they're like that girlfriend or boyfriend <laughs> that's like already planned like your next six vacations oh by like the third date. Um, like that that was like happening with the next book, and I I kind of freaked out. I'm like, look. <laughs> this yeah. is not helping. Um, I appreciate the amount of support you're giving me, but like, this is just making it worse. Like, this yeah. is, you know, if every time I get an email like, "Oh, Harper's like spending this, and they're assigning this these many people to your sales team," like, and then I sit there and I and like I go to like write, I'm like, man, it's too like much pressure. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Can we just get back to like, like, let me just focus on the ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, I I don't want to think about you know, all, all that sort of stuff. I, I don't want to define myself right. um, by those sorts of things because one, whenever I start to, you know, like that, it starts killing my creativity. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I, I just try to let go of that. Yeah. Um, I've, I've actually, I've got a section in the book called jokingly called kill yourself, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is where I, I basically tell people to kind of let go of these narratives of them. Like you don't know how good, like, the funny thing about being good or bad at something, it's all about where you're standing, you know, like, you know, somebody could be watching this and they'd be like, man, Lewis house, he's killing it. You know? And it's like, from their perspective, like the, mm-hmm. the yardstick that you're, right, they're right. using, they can say that, but then all you have to do is go get a different yardstick. Yeah, go like a Warren Buffett. And he's like, yeah. Or like know. Howard Stern or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, like yeah, Oh, whatever. Lewis house. Was, yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever, man. Like, and so it's, it, it it's all arbitrary. It's yeah. all where it's all invented. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so I try to just like let go of that and, and, and get back to like, okay, what is something that's like valuable that I can contribute? Like you were saying, you know, like what's an idea that I think is important, can change lives, can yeah. change my life. Write that. And then, mm-hmm. you know, let everybody else decide it, whether I'm good or not. Yeah. No, I yeah. don't know. It's none of my business. <laughs> how, do, how does um? So what are your what is your vision next? Because you know you listen to Liz Gilbert's TED talk a bunch yeah. of times. Are you working on new ideas, or are you kind of like let me just be in the present and enjoy the moment? Yeah. For the year or two that it's just gonna ride, and then man, I wish I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I wish I could do that. I wish I could just like. I mean, you're probably getting big advance offers for the next book. Yeah. Because now you can kind of demand it and say, yeah. you know, write the seven figure checks. Let's yeah. Go. I mean, the, the money, listen, the money's great. No yeah, complaints. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I'm playing with ideas for the next book. Uh, I'm kind of exploring new things. Um, I kind of made the, 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 the mistake I made this year was I got a little excited, you know, all that stuff you just said about big advance checks and all the promotion mm-hmm. and everything. I got a little bit excited at the beginning of the year and I was like, yeah, I got this idea. Let's go, you know? And what I discovered a few months later was like, I kind of, I kind of put myself in a bind because what I discovered is like, or what I remembered is a big part of my creative process is coming up with like three or four bad ideas before I get to the good one. Mm-hmm. And so I got a few months in and I'm like, oh, wait, I think this is actually a bad idea. Like wow. I want to toss the whole, you know, I want to basically start over from scratch. Right. Um, and so that was kind of part of the, you know, telling my publisher, like, dude, back off. <laughs> like I need right. some time. I need some time to just suck for a while. Like, <laughs> yeah. you know, like that's, that's, in, th- I think that's an important part of any creative process. Yeah. Like you need to be able to fail without repercussions. You know, mm-hmm. I told my editor, I'm like, look, like if I want to like, delete a chapter or like rewrite an entire section like i don't want to feel like i can't do that because i think it's important to feel like you can do that Mm -hmm. um yeah and get back to doing what you do best which is writing articles doing research you know absolutely sharing ideas see what sticks an idea sticks online and it shares like by everyone you're like okay maybe i can lean into this a little more write a few more articles on it and be like oh now i've got the basis of my book yeah Absolutely. Uh, have you been right? I see you've been sharing a lot of the archives <laughs> over the last few months. Is, are oh, you, man. Are you called re- out. <laughs> <laughs> you're always like, from the archives, goody but oldie. You know, you're like, <laughs> still relevant. I mean, it's all evergreen. Yeah, yeah. So it's not like it's timely or something. Or sure. You know, it needs to be at a yeah. certain time. But um, 
Um, Got to get that traffic, you know? Yeah, um, I know. Are you writing new content or new articles? So it, it's of- funny you bring that up. I, I've kind of, now that I've gotten all that stuff resolved, yeah. you know, this past few weeks, um, I have been going back. I've been spending the past two weeks just like, just doing blog content and, I, and doing exactly what you're saying. Like, all right. Back to basics, man. Yeah, I've got a handful of ideas. I think they're pretty cool. Going to throw them up as our articles, see what happens, see mm-hmm. if it gets people talking, if people are really into it. Um, so, yeah, there's going to be a lot more blog and online content coming over the next few months. That's great. Um, which I feel really good about. I feel, I feel like everything is kind of balance is being restored to the force. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> so, removing the pressure from the publishers, yeah, and agents and all this. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's been, it's been a wild experience, both, you know, on both sides. Like, it's just, it's surreal. Like, it's, it's amazing. Man. Some, 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 like the good things that happen, it's completely surreal and it's just scrambles your brain. And then, you know, and then two weeks later, it's like pressure you've never felt before because the, <laughs> the publisher's like, you know, we're doing this and this, this. It's like, whoa, right, time right. out. <laughs> right. What's been the craziest experience you've had since it came out? Um, well, apparently Chris Hemsworth is a big fan of it. Mm, I think we, I saw him. You posted a photo on Instagram of him holding it, I think. Or? Yeah, so he posted it and it was completely unprovoked. He posted it on Instagram and Facebook uh, and he wrote this like long thing I mean, it was like he loved it. I mean, it, he cool. was just gushing about it, and I, cool. and I was like, "That's crazy! Like, how does that happen?" Yeah, you know. Um, so that's that's been pretty awesome. Um, getting stopped on the street, yeah, the first few times was like, "Whoa, yeah, weird, right? weird, yeah, <laughs> really weird." <laughs> yeah, um, weird stuff. Like my dad was walking around with the book, and and somebody's like he in a restaurant like somebody like came up to him was like, like i love that book yeah and my dad's like my son wrote it and the guy's <laughs> like yeah whatever that's hilarious <laughs> wow yeah so it's and i'm been, sure you got a ton of big press and features and all these different places right yeah i think the f word scared people off ah. yeah so it's been hit and miss in that in that wow. arena um which is weird hmm you would think they would be like jumping on the bandwagon, but it's controversial. Yeah. Book. Yeah. 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 Um, the, it, it's funny. There was the only time it appeared it, like it was mentioned in the New York times. It was basically this old guy complaining about how many books have the F word in the title these days. Really? <laughs> and I was like, seriously, like, <laughs> this is, this is what the times is running. Wow. <laughs> but it sounds like it's been an amazing journey. Yeah, man. Um, a couple final questions for you. Sure. Um, Talk to me about can anyone do anything great Mm -hmm. or meaningful from a victim mentality or is a victim mentality the quickest way to die? I think, uh, I think a victimhood mentality, I think by definition, yeah, you can't really, because I think once you adopt the victim mentality, you are basically deciding you are powerless. You were saying like, this thing is happening to me and there's nothing I can do about it. Like, to me, that's the definition of a victimhood mentality, like deciding you are powerless. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's 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 basically impossible. Mm-hmm. I think the, the first step to accomplishing anything, big or small, whatever, um, is acknowledging that you are in control, that you get to decide, that you, there is this, even if it's the smallest thing, mm-hmm. you know, I can do this. I can decide to work on this. Um, and it's hard because that, that requires taking on responsibility, you know, being like, okay, like this is my thing now. Like I, I have to do this. Mm-hmm. I think it's easier and it kind of worries me because I, I, I think our culture is getting lulled into this complacency of just being like, oh, all this horrible stuff's happening. And, but it's not my fault. You know, yeah. So I'm just gonna complain about it. It's mm-hmm. like and do nothing. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's like no, you gotta take responsibility, get out there, do something, and take ownership. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of people who are living in that victim mentality. Maybe not in all areas of their life, but in some area, area yeah. of their life, and they're like, well, there's just nothing I can do. Yeah. I don't have the time. I don't have the energy. Yeah. Resources. It's like, well, you're not gonna be able to do anything if you think that way. Yeah. Yeah, totally. But if you can create it and say, I do have the time. Let me make it. Yeah. I do have the resources. Let me start asking people, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. Well, and, and there are people that something terrible <clears throat> legitimately happens to them, you yeah. know? And, and all of us, something all, terrible happens. Yeah. Like something, it's 
everybody, we all suffer tragedy and trauma yeah. at some point. Um, but, and that may be, you know, and you, yes, you may be a victim like in that moment when that thing is happening. But, you know, a day later, a week later, a year later, 10 years later, like at some point you have to be like, hey, it happened, but like, what am I going to do now? Yeah. You know, what am I going to do about it? Yeah. What would you say is your biggest fear moving forward? <laughs> <laughs> just <laughs> flopping at whatever I do next. Wow. Totally. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, th there's a funny thing and, and I'm sure you experience this too. Like any, anything entrepreneurial that you do, you always have this irrational fear that like, it's going to be over. Like then, it, like, <laughs> you know, like what, what, like whatever the next thing is going to be, it's just like, it's going to crash and burn and you know, whatever it's, it's all going to be over. It's mm -hmm. like, Oh, this was just a fad or I got lucky yeah, or yeah. I was in the right place at the right time. And, and there's always like every entrepreneur I know has that kind of like lingering doubt mm -hmm. in the back of their mind. Um, and it's, it's funny cause it just doesn't, doesn't go away. Like my, yeah. my, my dad, he, he started a plastics business back in the sixties. Um, and he's still going now he's he just turned 70 wow and i talked to him once and and he's like he's like i've been doing this almost 50 years and he's like i'm still ter like i'm afraid our biggest accounts are, mm -hmm. are gonna leave us i i'm a terrified of a lawsuit there's a competitor could open up any day mm -hmm. and do our formulas better like right. he's still like yeah it could all be over next year you know like but i think a little bit of that anxiety is 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 useful you yeah know? it keeps you keeps you on your toes i feel like the way you will fail or have a failure or not as a good of success the next time is if you care too much about what everyone thinks yeah if you literally like give a fuck yeah exactly about <laughs> and try to be like i'm gonna write it in a way that like yeah. pleases everyone exactly as opposed to being like no this is what i believe it this is my counterintuitive feelings on yep. this specific topic yeah here's why and you back it up yeah i think if you were like well i don't care if anyone likes this right but here's what's worked for me. Yeah. And here's what's worked for other people. Yeah. I want to write it in that style. I think it'll do well. Yeah. So the the soul art of not giving a f about, you know, relationships or money or whatever it is. I don't yeah. know, but something like that. Yeah. Or the counterintuitive approach to making money. You know, whatever yeah, it may yeah. be. So yeah. Um, give me credit for that next idea. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Royalty check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything that you, um, that you wish people would ask you that they don't ask? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, it's one of those questions too. I feel like there is something, but like, <laughs> you don't know what it I is. can't, I can't like, it's, I've probably done other interviews where I'm like, God, why isn't this guy asking this? But like now that I'm put on the spot, I can't think of it. Or is there anything that you really wish you got to share or talk about that you don't reveal? I know you talk a lot about your vulnerabilities, but yeah. is there anything that you feel like, you wish people knew about you more. Yeah, I I don't know. I'm I'm kind of an open book. Um you know, I will say like I I'm, I'm I'm genuinely excited about your book. I'm not oh, just you. I'm not just plugging you cuz I'm you. on your show. Like I I really <laughs> am. I was telling you before the show like I was I took a stab at writing a book like this yeah. like 5 years ago cuz I I come from you know, I got my my roots are men's dating advice basically yes. and um you know so i ran like a men's dating advice site for a number of years and um and i worked with a lot of clients i, I worked with a lot of men who were struggling um i mean they came to me because they were struggling in their with their relationships but you know a lot of times they were also struggling professionally in all these other ways and and um doing all the research back then like i came to a lot of the same conclusions that yeah. you do and uh it's a scary topic. It is, man. It's super vulnerable. It is. Because I kind of reveal my all my weaknesses in yeah. every aspect of being a man. Yeah. For my whole life. But you know, I'm I'm glad you like you're the right one to do it. Cause like the reason I gave it up, so I started it and you know, I had a lot of very similar conclusions and, and a lot of the similar points. Mm -hmm. But it was I felt weird because I was coming from like my big mask as you would say like uh -huh. my big thing my big insecurity as a man was always around like like i was the i was like the party playboy you know like mm -hmm. i was out drinking all the time i was chasing girls all the time um and that was my way of like overcompensating like proving myself all mm -hmm. the time and so 
whatever I was going to write was going to be rooted in that. And unfortunately, like it's still just really like not socially acceptable, right. <laughs> you know, to, and, it, and it's just not as like, I, you know, you coming from like an athletics background, uh-huh. coming from a business background, like those are much more, you know, and saying like, Hey, like this is an issue that men deal with. Like, this is something that I dealt with, yeah. you know, when I was writing and it was like, Hey, I spent like five years drinking and just banging girls. And <laughs> let me tell you, it sucked. You know, right, like, right, like, right. it just doesn't, it didn't sound good. Yeah. And it, it wasn't something I wanted to like, um, it, it didn't feel like something that was going to like really resonate with a lot of men mm-hmm. or like get the point across. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I can Tucker Max kind of did that with yeah. his books, but it was more of like him bragging about it, which, yeah. <laughs> which did well. That's what sold it so well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then when he kind of stopped bragging about it, yeah, it didn't do as well. Yeah. You know? In yeah. Some regards. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there's still a judgment there. Yeah. There's still yeah. like, you know, Oh, he's a sleaze bag, you know, like mm-hmm. you can't how seriously can we take him? Yeah. And I didn't really want to invite that right, right, right. into my career. Right, right. Um, but I, I also just felt like it wasn't gonna be as powerful. Like I, I think I think what's gonna make yours more powerful is you know, the the stuff around, you know, because what you excelled in, the athletics and everything, mm-hmm. like that is like that's the mainstream pressure yeah. that's put on boys. All the kids who are athletes who grew yeah. up and feeling that they couldn't like show their emotion, they, yeah. they had to like be a man at an early age. They yeah. couldn't be a pussy or whatever it is. You yeah. had to like just not feel pain. All these different things that hold us back from showing emotion, releasing certain yeah. things that allow us to be vulnerable. Yeah, allow us to connect with other human beings. Yeah, uh, that create more anger and resentment inside of us for a long term that we're unable to express it in a loving way yeah. or in a, a, a safe way. We a healthy exp- way. A, yeah. a healthy way. Yeah. We express it through fighting, through screaming, through yep. punching walls and thinking that's like the manly thing you're supposed to do. Right. And I think I appreciate you saying that I'm the right one to talk about it. I just feel like a lot of guys could relate to someone who looks like me, who's, yeah. been, who's <laughs> been through experiences like me. Yeah. As a jock-looking dude, you know, yeah. who played a ton of sports, yeah, who's you know built businesses and things like that. I think, hopefully, I'm going to be able to resonate to a lot of men. Yeah, that would would never listen to an Oprah, a Brene Brown, yeah, a Deepak Chopra. Yeah. Um. So hopefully, hopefully, yeah. You know, I have no idea. <laughs> I appreciate you endorsing it because yeah, man. Uh, I'm excited to get it out there. I actually think a lot of women are going to buy it. Like tons of women are going to buy it. Yeah. Well, actually, so I I self published. Uh, so my my dating advice book it's called Models Attract Women Through Honesty, mm. and uh, one of the things, uh, like one of the biggest I guess like things that that I guess one of the things that makes me feel the best about it is I get emails all the time from women who are like, I bought this for my brother. Mm-hmm. I bought this for my husband. I yeah. bought this for my son. Yeah. Um, because like this, like he's having trouble, you know, he's having relationship problems or he's having trouble meeting women. And like, I, there's a lot of scummy stuff out there, Yeah. but it's like a woman reads it and she's like, yeah, this is what the guy I love or I mm-hmm. care about, like should, should be reading. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you'll probably get a lot of that too. Yeah. We'll see. Which is great. Who knows how to do it? <laughs> Did you have an idea that this was going to sell a million copies? And no. This? <laughs> no, absolutely well, not. Know. We have no idea. It could be massive. It could be yeah. nothing. Yeah, right. It could be like, eh. You really have no idea. But uh, I feel excited about it because I'm, I'm proud about like being so open and yeah. and giving an amazing effort yeah. at trying to connect with people that I feel like are yeah. struggling the most. Yeah which are the men in, in our society right now, specific, specifically with the challenges in uh, our political leadership where oh, yeah. there's a lot of controversy and, you know, all the, the hate crimes and everything. It's just like, where is it coming from? Yeah. You know, how can we move forward in a place of love and uplift all of humanity? That's yeah. my mission. Yeah. So I feel like it starts within. I had to look within myself first yeah. and say, wow, there's probably a lot of men who are facing a similar challenge. Yeah, there are. Um, I appreciate your support there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is a question called the three truths. Okay. You've written how many articles now? Oh God, hundreds. I don't know. <laughs> hundreds of articles. <laughs> You've got a, a New York Times best selling smashing hit with a million copies sold in the first year, which probably one of twenty people have done in the the history of time <laughs> in the first nine months. Um 
and and let's imagine that you've achieved everything you want to achieve, yeah. which, which I know you don't have any big dreams. You keep it neutral. <laughs> but let's say you achieve everything you want to. Sure. And it's your last day for you many, many years from now. Okay. It's your last day. You're 100 and however old you want to be. Okay. And you've written many best-selling projects. All the content you want to write has been out there. You've sure. done all the research. You've sure. got all the answers for yourself. Yeah. you shared it with the world. But for whatever reason, it's all erased. Okay. No one has access to any book that okay. you've ever done or any article. Okay. And you've got a piece of paper and a pen yeah. to write down three truths. Yeah. Three things you know to be true about everything you've learned and sure. this is all that the world would be able to have to remember you by. Yeah. What would be those lessons or those three truths? <sighs> three, man. Um, <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Come on. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, the first one that comes to mind is what really, and, and it, it feels so cliche to say out loud, but it, it is a really profound thing. It took me a long time to realize is that really. At the end of the day, the what really matters is the relationships with the people in your life. You know, um, success, accolades, money, having fun. Like, these are all great things. Um, but if you don't have people close to you to share them with or to support or help support you, um, pretty much anything will eventually feel empty. Mm -hmm. Um so that would be a big one. Second one I would say is that anything worthwhile is going to require some sort of sacrifice. Um, and a lot of people, you know, everybody's heard that. And, and I think when people hear that, they think of that, they think of in terms of like, oh yeah, sacrifice, like you got to work hard and you mm -hmm. got to stay at the office late. You got to like, and that's true. But I think there's actually a, a, a deeper and, and more difficult sacrifice, especially for our generation, which is, to commit to something, to like make it meaningful and worthwhile and, and, and do it extremely well, become great at it. You have to be willing to give up maybe other dreams or mm -hmm. things that you want. Um, you know, there came a point in my career where I was like, you know, this writing thing is going really well. You know, that was actually what killed my music dreams was the writing mm -hmm. because it was like the writing thing's going so well, I would be an idiot to like, <laughs> stop yeah. and like go go start a band or something like you know it and so i had to let it go i had to be like you know it's it's just not gonna happen um and and there was a grieving process for that but it was like it was okay you know yeah. i moved on yeah. um and so i think that's kind of that's the sacrifice is like as you especially as you get older you have to like realize that there's just some things that you're never gonna do and that's okay. Like we all have to decide that at some point. Mm -hmm. um, third one. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> your last truth. <laughs> <laughs> the last truth that Mark Manson will ever leave behind. Um, I don't know, man. Just uh, don't give a fuck. Yeah, don't you know? give a fuck. I don't know. <laughs> Vulnerability. A lot of stuff we've been talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess you you always have you always you can always choose like you always have the power to decide you always have the power to decide like what something means um you always have the power to decide what to do next um there's no situation where you aren't empowered in some way yeah those are great yeah. man I love those well I want to acknowledge you Mark for constantly reinventing yourself being open and vulnerable and taking the time to write something that matters to you. Yeah. And I'm so glad that it matters to so many other people as well. Yeah. But just your commitment to constantly doing the work. Yeah. You know, you've been doing this for years now and you're seeing the results come through. It's, it's amazing. And I'm super excited for you. So I want to acknowledge you for your vulnerability by constantly opening up yeah. and showing other people how they can open up as well. Cause I think that's one of the most important things. Yeah. It's not trying to act like you're better than you are or more important than you are or perfect. Yeah. And by doing work that matters, it's really meaningful. So I Thanks, acknowledge man. you for that, man. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, make sure you guys get the book. We have one final question. Make sure you get the subtle art of not giving a fuck. <laughs> uh, a counterintuitive approach to living a good life by Mark Manson, the mega hit. Um, and where do you hang out online the most? 
since you're not really on social media that much, but where can we connect with you and say hi and yeah. tell you how amazing this is? Uh, so my website, markmanson.net, um, got all sorts of articles and cool like PDFs and yeah. eBooks and stuff. Uh, so check that out. And uh, social media, facebook.com slash markmanson.net. Um, I actually do post there and there will be new stuff posted. No, there. your Facebook's great. You're posting Very a lot. Soon, yeah. yeah. Mark Manson net on yeah. Facebook. And then uh, if you want to come to my Instagram and once a month, you'll yeah. get something <laughs> and see a picture once a month. <laughs> I'm there too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Very cool, man. Well, I'm excited for this. And, um, the final question for you is what's your definition of greatness? Definition of greatness. I would say is, I would say it is the feeling that, oh man, it's one of those things that's like, I have it in my head, but I got to get the <laughs> right words to like, sure. I would say my definition of greatness is simply um, the experience of living your potential. Um having a, having an idea or a vision um and then actually like bringing that into reality mm. you know whatever it is could be like hosting a pta meeting you yeah. know it could be writing a bestseller it could be starting a business it could be um tutoring your kids like it mm. you know it's having a vision for yourself um and for the people you care about and then actually like realizing that mm. that's what i would say love it yeah mark manson thanks man appreciate you